Welcome to the Chief of Anything podcast in this four-tone vierklang format with Catherine Wutz and Dominic Klimek. Our vierklang format talks about the interplay of purpose, vision, values and strategies and about what happens to companies when we bring these four together. Here I hear firsthand how the vierklang strategy has transformed companies and what I can expect from its implementation. Hello, Dominic. How are you today? I'm very joyful, Catherine. How are you doing today? I feel very blessed this morning as we're recording this because we have the chance to talk to Melanie Gleason. Melanie has been familiar with the Vierklang model of purpose, vision, values and strategies for quite some time now. Melanie, we'll, we'll hear from you in a second. So just to introduce you here, you've worked with Graham Ma um, many, many years ago and you're all about transformational change. Now you've got obviously a very long experience with this Vierklang model. What's kind of like your favorite story to tell the most impactful you found this model to be since you've known it? Well, it would have to be my Vodafone chapter by far. Um, it kind of set the course of my career, really. Um, I, um, I trained in psychology, got a BSc in psychology um, because I was actually working for in New Zealand at the time that it was um, privatised. So it was a government department and some merchant bankers bought it. Um, and I was purchasing aircraft parts um, at the big hangars in, in Christchurch. And, um, and so I knew how those hangers operated and I knew the guys that made them stop and go. And then when the really flash guys came down from Auckland, as they do in M&A, um, for the consultants out there, you know, they, they flew in in their black suits and, and walked around everywhere. And then I talked to the foreman of the hangers to say, oh, you know, what were they like? What did they ask you? And they said, oh, we didn't meet them. And I was like, how do they know how this place operates if they didn't talk to you? And up until that point, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my career. And, um, and I was like, that's what I want to do. And I think it's called org development, I think. Studied psychology, um, got into it. It was very, I am a bit old, so it was in its infancy. Um, Anyway, ended up with an advertising and marketing career, as you do, um, and ended up launching Vodafone in New Zealand. This is the abridged version. And um, and then after a while, we had, you know, we had great success. And I went to Graham and I said, the inside still feels like Bell South and it doesn't align. Um, we need to do something about it. Anyway, he restructures the marketing department and he says, you know, we've got the consumer side, the business side which would you like to do? And I said, well, I've kind of had the privilege of doing both. Maybe it's time for a new chapter for me. And he goes, no, stay and do that thing you've been bugging me about. And I said, what thing I've been bugging you about? And he goes, you know, the culture stuff, the people stuff. And I'm like, oh, cool. And then I was like, oh, shit, now I have to do it. Um, so, so yes, definitely that, that Graham chapter would have to be would have to be the highlight of my career and seeing where that model pays off in spades. Quick question you just mentioned when you were talking to the foreman uh, of the mm. company where like the mm. M&A guys came in and you realized that they hadn't spoken to the people so they maybe knew theoretically how this company operates but they haven't spoke to the people. How did this make you feel? at that moment? What was your emotion that you were going through at that time? I was incredulous. I was, what do you mean they didn't speak to you? I, everyone knew that there were about four guys that that ran the place. We had a we had contracts with the US Navy down to the Antarctic. It was a really big operation and Air New Zealand did a lot of its e engineering aircraft maintenance there. This was a really big operation and I was like, well, I know you can look at the accounting department because you can look at the spreadsheets in those days and the numbers, but wow, just just wow yeah so and and i suppose that was because i didn't come at it from someone with a business degree um i was an employee and i watched how this organization worked 
Yeah, and I watched what happened when things went wrong and who fixed them, and it was these guys and their teams because they knew how to run their teams. So you really approach it more from an observational point of view. So so look at what's going on, observe, you know, if something goes wrong, who fixes it? And those are the people I need to talk to. Those are the people who, who know how it's done in essence. So how did that, I wonder, come into place when you when you got to take charge of the cultural stuff, as, <laughs> as you've named it earlier? And and Grandma, who was one of the first people to, to actually bring this model together in the combination of purpose, vision, values and strategies. How did you go on about that? I I knew that it had to be part top down and part bottom up. So, you know, you can't do it totally top down because then it's like, well, it's just a dictatorship um, and you don't get the engagement. But, but equally, it was an animal farm. Um, you weren't just going to throw it over to the staff to say, although he was a really cool person um, and, he, and he used to do some, some really leading edge stuff. If anyone was going to do that, it would have been Graham. But, um, you know, Daniel Goleman years later went on to write that article in HBR about, um, you know, who are the people that make organisations stop and go? Um, that's actually based on Karen Stevenson's work, who's who's a complete genius. Um, but that's what it's all about. It's, it's, it's allowing the people who who know the organisation inside and out to have a say. They are the people that are seeing it at the coalface. And I have not been into an organisation where, you know, and I'm saying the staff, but I'm, I'm meaning employees, team members, um, you know, where they don't know exactly what needs fixing. They always know. They absolutely always know. It sounds so simple when you say it, right? Allow the people who know the organization inside <laughs> out to to take care of it, in essence. <laughs> Now, what I found to be so true in life is that simple doesn't necessarily mean it's easy, right? So oh. even though it's... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, oh, I, um, you know, on the on your podcast episode, which I've listened to, and and um, that's exactly what Jan Mottram, the head of HR at Vodafone at the time that I was there, um, and the Qatar um, exec team said, you know, it, it is great. But it's not easy. It's actually not that easy, which is why often organisations don't do it, um, because it does take um, it takes bravery at the top to actually be super clear about your vision, because then you'll get questioned, and there's a lot of people that don't like that. Um, it takes bravery because then you've made it public in the sense of you don't take everything public, public, but public to the organisation. Uh, And so again, you'll get questioned on that and challenged. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a it's a brave thing to do. And then when you're rallying organisations, and even if you don't give, you know, a thousand people, two thousand people, three thousand people, everyone a voice, but you do some cross-functional focus groups and representation, that takes coordination and effort. And at the same time, you've got a business to run. So. Everyone's got their day jobs. So who's going to do this? But you can't farm that out. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it is not simple. And, you know, there's been lots of quotes around um, how powerful clarity is. But getting clarity isn't, isn't, isn't a simple process. I mean, I did have a fantastic um, mentor in a woman called Adrienne Baitup Carlson, who is now based in Sydney, has a consultancy called Luminous, and she was a pioneer in that area at that time of doing values-based, as we used to call it, before the, 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 the purpose and the strategy really came into Graham's evolved model. Um, and she also has, she has a very big brand background. And I think for me, also having a, a marketing and branding background um, gave me those insights around striving for clarity, the kind of clarity that marketing people tie themselves in knots over. And most other people from other functions would go, you're navel gazing and you just need to put something down on paper, <laughs> paper and move through it. But, you know, marketing people are trying to get to that really edgy, concise, differentiating point of point of difference. So no, it's not easy. You just said something very interesting and this reminded me of a picture I saw, I think when I was still in school and you saw a lot of like horses, like big, powerful horses and they were running in one direction and it says 
like first class leaders have first class employees. And next to that was a picture and there was like a horse and you could see like, does this horse, is this even able to walk? And behind it were horses that were like almost dead. And it says like second class leaders have third class employees because they don't like to be challenged. And when I have the Vierklang model and I have the clarity and I know that everybody is uh, looking at me because I say this is our goal, this is the company goal, and at some point, me as the CEO, as the leadership team, we might not get there as promised. Like one of these strategies will fail for sure. And then I have to have the bravery to say, okay, like we didn't achieve it. And being able to do this requires a lot of bravery. And on the same time, when I do this, I inspire the whole company. We just had a different podcast uh, with the uh, founders from Zukunftsmotor and they said the moment when we speak to everybody and say like, this is our strategies and we didn't achieve them, but this creates a complete different culture in the company going away from like, this is a mistake and this is a mistake to we want to learn and grow something here. And this inspires everybody else. And Franz and Julia said when they do this and when they have the bravery to show, this helps a lot of people and there are not as many uh, finger pointing and mistakes because then I create this whole company. And I think it's very inspiring and so true what you said. I need to have the bravery mm. to be able to be like a first class leader because when I have amazing employees, of course, they will question me. These are not yes. third class employees. They want to have a voice and to say. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, the um, you know, you know, there's a lot in common with the, with growth mindset and really strong leadership because you need to you need to view those times that you don't make it as a learning opportunity. And in order to do that, you can't be a CEO with a really big ego because that's just going to freak you out completely. And I can't admit failure. And then, you know, I can't be authentic. And then, and then, and then. And all of that has a has a flow on effect versus being able to do all of the things that you just um, explained um, and inspire people however be you know truly truly authentic um and and that's what makes people dig really deep and follow yeah the melanie if if i hear you talking right so there was a lot of challenges and there was a way you guys have, have managed to overcome them if we have people listening right now who you know might be thinking to themselves well i've got a lot of challenges in my business and i don't really know how to go on about them what would be your number one tip for them maybe the number one tool you said you know that's really helped me to turn things around in terms of engaging their employees or being able to turn their business around. Yes, okay. So I think um, the first step for me is always clarity. Um, and I learned this in branding. Um, and it's really, really important, obviously, in building a vision for your organization. So that's the first thing that I would do, would be able to be, get myself into a space um, with some inspiring people. Look, if they're inside your organization, awesome. If they're not, um, if they're friends, get somewhere and reconnect with your vision for the organization. And then very closely followed behind that would be your purpose. What is actually your greater purpose? What are you here to do? And how do you want to be? And write those down and, um, and really, really stay true to those. And then look at your business really honestly, um, note where the business is succeeding and where the business uh, needs to improve. Um, and someone mentioned it. I actually I actually think it might have, might have been Michael Ports on that um, Qatar Vodafone exec team, the stop, start, continue model. That is that that also takes bravery. Well, we've got this initiative going and we're currently talking to them and we've also got this and oh, and I couldn't and I can't stop that and I can't stop that. Well, actually you can. It was one of the first things that Graham did when he came and took the reins over what was then Bell South to Vodafone. He said, what is everything going on in the business? And everyone went, are you sure you want to know? And he goes, absolutely, I want to know. And he did exactly that. And some of them, you know, people had to stop projects, stop initiatives, stop partnerships and focus. So that would be one of the first things I would do. Um, 
And at that point, then I would involve your people and be really clear about that process you've just gone through and warts and all and say to them, you know, Sally was really wedded to us having this kind of purpose. But in the at the end of the day, we agreed that this was more important. Really um, show them that you've got nothing to hide and invite them into um, that vision and that purpose, then take them through the stop, start, continue, which will be really sobering for a lot of people because it might be their pet projects, but seen in the framework of what it is that you want to achieve. Hopefully they'll see the, the context and the rationale. And there might be opportunities to um, to lobby and say, I hear you, however, um, there was a lot of that. Mostly Graham stuck to his guns. Um, the you know the leader undergoing that has to be super courageous and have the ability to stay really firm to the to the vision and the purpose. Um, and then involve your people in a discussion around some values. What are the what are the things that have worked for the organisation to date? What are some of the again stop start continue? And then when I do values work, I talk about foundation values, the things that you really need to do to be in, and have to be in business. So these are things like um, trust and integrity. You, 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 you can't run a business and a healthy culture without those. But also, if you've, if you've set a really inspiring vision, what are some of the edgier values, for want of a better word? I had a client that couldn't, wasn't allowed to call them values, and so we called them superpowers. What are, the, what are some of the superpowers that your, your staff think you need in order to achieve your vision? And write them down and define them. So do workshops with staff, make it really fun, make it really clever. No such thing as a bad idea. Really unlock people. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Melanie, for, for that explanation. And uh, what I'm hearing as well from, from what you're saying is once I have a clear purpose, I have a clear vision, I know what my values are, then those are the guideposts for the stop, start, continue. Those are the check marks where I then can go, well, this initiative, even though we've put a lot of time and effort and money into it, right? Does it really lead us closer to our vision? Does it really fulfill the purpose and why we're here beyond making money, right? Does it follow our values or is there discrepancies in that? And then, of course, we can have these discussions. We can have, you know, good discussions and, and heated discussions if they have to be. And we have kind of like the, the, the lamppost, the guideline. Hey, this is what we're basing our decisions on. Brilliant. Thank you. Totally. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, we haven't really heard um, about who you are as a person and maybe the purpose comes in really nicely to this question. So, so would you like to tell us a little bit about you as a person, what you do now, what's, what's your purpose that's guiding you and where has the journey taken you since the Qatar days? Um, I wasn't actually, I wasn't actually in Qatar. Um, I was um, in little old New Zealand um, and I actually went on after that um, to set up my own consultancy, which I called Decibel, um, because it is about turning up the volume um, and I am a little bit loud. So someone that was helping me at the time um, suggested it. So um, I, did, I did go to consulting and I... I set out to go to consulting to small to medium sized enterprises who New Zealand has a lot of, um, who didn't have a marketing director or an HR director at the level of working on the on the on the vision and the values and the purpose. Um, but by a quirk of fate, ended up working for some big businesses. So um, Holden in Melbourne uh, was owned by General Motors. Um, I did some work over there with the exec team. Um, who happened to also be their board, um, which was really interesting that after all their success and the size of their business, their, um, they actually had a, um, a German CEO, Peter Hannenberger, and um, he was pretty imposing and the values were really, really important to him. Um, I did some work for, I did do some work for small to medium businesses in New Zealand, which I love. Um, often when they were rebranding or they were merging um, industries across finance, I, I did um, our, t our rail company. Um, I then, I kind of missed uh, working with a lot of people because I love bouncing ideas. And so I had done some work 
for um, a marketing director of an energy company that had been through a pretty adversarial merger and he was taking over um, as CEO of an ad agency who he described was a comfy old pair of slippers and um, and I'd rate him up there with Graham Ma. His name is Brian Crawford. And um, he also understood the power of, of purpose and vision and values and was really courageous as well. So I did a project for him and then I ended up joining them. Um, that also involved a trip to New York, uh, um, getting transferred to New York. I ended up back in New Zealand. I moved to Perth um, and I did in Perth what a lot of people in Perth do and that is work for mining and oil and gas companies. I then did three years in Melbourne um, where I um, I worked on a really big project for a very fast growing council who had done its first ever um, reorg and they were moving to um, a state of the art building and um, we needed to achieve staff engagement around their new vision. Um, so that was that was pretty exciting chapter, did some more merger work and um, and returned to Perth. So um, it's me and my dog. I do ride horses. So I've got lots of horse analogies, Dominic. Um, and my personal values, um, clarity, balance, joy, and inspiration. Uh, clarity for me is, is number one um, because it serves you during those times of ambiguity and during the times when things are not going great. Uh, balance for similar reasons. Um, I have worked pretty hard in my life and, and burnt myself out. So I've learned that lesson and I've certainly learned the value of balance. Um, joy, because I think you really need to recognize it and the world needs more of it. And inspiration, I'm a, I'm a super avid reader and hopefully during the work that I've done, I've managed to also share some inspiration. So yeah, my life is about transformation and yeah Wonderful. busy and like so many <laughs> so many uh like stations and you said one interesting thing at the end you said like your life is about transformation in all your like the industries you have seen like the companies you have seen what's the biggest problem most companies face why they are not as successful as they could be what's the biggest challenge that they have i i think it is around it so is around the vision and purpose and values creating a culture. And I think one of the biggest problems is is that they actually think that true having a great culture and having really high staff engagement is 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 difficult. And by that, I mean, it's not easy in terms of the process, but they almost believe it's impossible and it's not impossible. You've just got to be really brave because you've got to come at things from a completely different angle. And I think a lot of businesses, um, you know, even if they're government based organizations, they've got stakeholders and shareholders wanting to see results on really short, you know, on, on a quarterly basis. They want to see results, especially the ones that are listed on the stock market and they have share prices. And I just don't think they, I just don't think they understand the true value if they were really, really committed to during, doing that work. Super, you know, as committed to the purpose. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what if somebody listening to this and say, okay, maybe I have might have fallen into this trap. What would you recommend as a first step? Not the whole process, but what is the first step a CEO of a company uh, could take to like steer in a new or like in a better direction to get actually to the results that they want to achieve? There isn't one CEO I haven't met that doesn't know in their heart and in their gut what the company could achieve and they're frustrated. So I would say to them, connect with that believe that it's true and stay really hell-bent on keeping that as their core vision. I haven't met one of them that hasn't. They'll start talking to me and I'm like, you know it already. You know it already. So be quite ruthless in their pursuit of it. Cut down the level of noise on, on everything else and get super, super, super focused. And do the stop, start, continue. Just do even do that. Just to, just in order to get focused. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like um, like if you want to conquer the island, burn the boats. So like you have the vision inside of you, <laughs> yes. and then 
if you if you truly believe in this vision um, and ju- believe that it is possible, and then you might not know how to get there, but you will find the way to get to that vision if it's the only option to achieve that, because then I will take the necessary measures like the start, stop, continue, or whatever tool I need to make it that this is the only option, that we will be as successful as I believe and see this is truly possible, like in my gut or in my heart. Mm. And often I see, uh, you know, and people often don't view them as positive opportunities when companies are in trouble and they've got no choice, then they really get tough and they get super, super focused and they have to do it. So, you know, companies that are in trouble, um, mergers because you've got to bring two organisations together, you've got no choice, Um, or, you know, companies that are brave enough to go through some kind of um, self-imposed transformation, like a rebranding or a repositioning in the marketplace. They need to set themselves a really aggressive timeline. I want this done by then. This is who we're going to be. You know, and that's why lots of startups are so successful and blaze past big incumbent companies because that's the mindset they've got. Yeah. Brilliant. So so kind of like when we look back at, at everything we've talked about, what would you say is the most impactful that this model of, of you know, asking yourself the questions, well, what's what's our purpose beyond making money? What is the vision? Where will we, you know, where will we have gotten to five years from now if everything's gone incredibly? And what are what are the values we live by? Right? We we treat each other with, we treat our customers with, and and finally, of course, what are co- the concrete strategies we need to deploy in order to to make sure that we can fulfill our purpose and reach our vision and, and live our values. Um, so what's the biggest takeaway of asking or any CEO, any any business leadership asking themselves these questions and finding the answers? I, um, th- there's a book. <laughs> there's a book that I use with, with um, companies that are really committed to this journey. And I use a combination of um, a brand architecture model with the vision, the values and the purpose added first then really classic traditional brand architecture model. And there is a there is a book that was written just after we launched Vodafone, so we didn't copy it. Um, and it's called Eating the Big Fish. And it is all about having that entrepreneurial mindset. And it has some really, really amazingly practical steps in it. Like establish a lighthouse identity. And so that's all about being clear around exactly who you are and what you stand for, and also what you don't. So it's got it, it's a it's a it's a fantastic book that basically talks you through those steps. Um, and if you Google it, there's lots of templates and lots of other people read about the book. But it is it's all about having that clarity um, and and getting yourself a, a roadmap and one that you can inspire your inspire your teams around. That's absolutely the takeaway it it can be done and it's so exciting to watch it's so rewarding to see teams that are tired disengaged change fatigued think you know quiet quitting to suddenly see them sit up wide-eyed roll their sleeves up and go okay i'm in and then talking to their colleagues forming teams and subcommittees themselves like there is nothing more rewarding and the energy and the momentum that that gives an organization yeah if they do it right it should absolutely blow the ceo and the exec team away brilliant thank you so much for sharing melanie and Pleasure. If, uh, if we have any listeners right now um and, and you're based in, in perth australia right I now am. i am who's <laughs> who say we need that energy that resonates from Mel we need you know we need that change management right now we need support how do they find you uh, Melanie Gleason at decibel dot world fabulous <laughs> thank you so much for being with us thank um, you all so much all the best Thank you. And all the best to you. I love your podcast and I'm going to tune in to more episodes. And thank you so much for starting early to accommodate the um, the person in Perth on the other side of Australia. Well, thank you for staying late for us. We can give that right back. <laughs> in, my 30, an in, my pleasure. 30, in my 39 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Without aircon. Thanks so much, Melanie. It's been a pleasure and I'll talk to you soon.
That's it for today with Vier Klang Strategy Coaching in our Chief of Anything podcast. If you would like to discover the impact of Vier Klang Strategy Coaching for your company, then simply click on the link in the description and get in touch with us. 